Tensions rise as the United States orders the closure of the Chinese consulate in Houston, Texas. Hello, I'm Mike Walter, sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. China is vowing to respond with firm countermeasures after the United States ordered Beijing to close its consulate in Houston, Texas. In a dramatic escalation of tensions, the move by the Trump administration continues its pressure campaign against China over such issues as trade and the spread of the coronavirus. For more, we turn now to CGTN's Nathan King. He's at the White House for So, Nathan, uh, break it down for us. Uh, what does all of this mean, this U.S. move? Yeah, I mean, it all was a bit nebulous at the beginning. Mike Pompeo was in London, remember, giving uh, Boris Johnson, the PM, a slap on the back for their moves against Huawei. And then suddenly this happened, uh, catching China by surprise. But we're getting more and more details about what the U.S. is saying, essentially, uh, throughout the day. David Stitwell, the uh, most senior East Asia diplomat at the State Department, has been given interviews and basically said that the U.S. says... Uh, the, the Houston uh, 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 the, the consulate was used as essentially a hub to encourage students with state connections to essentially spy uh, on various uh, universities. Also, Mike Pompeo said it was a, a hub for uh, technology transfer and, and digging into the secrets of U.S. companies. Essentially, anything that China is accused of, Houston is apparently the ground zero, although uh, there had been no warning. Uh, whatsoever about it. And then, of course, we've got that weird video of burning uh, papers, which seem very well placed and uh, not coincident on the timing. But essentially, uh, what's happened is that, uh, you know, as of Friday, the Houston uh, consulate it will be no more, which is uh, quite incredible. Now, there have been some suggestions here in the U.S. that this is all very interesting in terms of the timing, because on Thursday, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, will be giving a speech at the Nixon Library in California talking about the allegations just made against the uh, uh, Houston Chinese consulate, which essentially gives him a nice little backdrop. So, Nathan, we've kind of uh, set the stage, and as you well know, covering all of this uh, with trade, with journalism, there's always this tit-for-tat approach uh, between these two countries. So how is Beijing likely to respond? Well, I mean, you know, it said it, it, it will respond. Well, first of all, actually, Beijing said, look, just revoke this and we can talk, essentially. Uh, but, but we'll respond in kind. And now, of course, as you've seen throughout Chinese social media and in, in the mainstream media, too, uh, lots of speculation about whether uh, Beijing will close a U.S. consulate. Would it be, for example, in Chengdu, in Sichuan? Would it be Wuhan? Could they even take steps in Hong Kong? Uh, we'll wait and see. Uh, but obviously, you know, with all these... Uh, all these uh, provocations that we've seen coming from Washington and, uh, and the tit for tat, uh, that remains to be seen. But, you know, when we thought things couldn't get much worse, there's always something else uh, to put on the pile. And, you know, I talked about Hong Kong. We talked about Xinjiang. We could talk about uh, the journalists, uh, you know, the trade situation. The one thing about Houston, though, I just want to raise, I think it was the first consulate ever established after uh, Richard Nixon and uh, Zhou Enlai and Mao Zedong actually uh, 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 met. So it's going to be an interesting sort of historical closure there. Nathan King Force at the White House, thanks so much. Uh, he's our CT CGTN uh, White House correspondent. Well, there's a lot to talk about, so let's get right to our panel. Joining us from Beijing is political and economic affairs commentator Einar Tangen. With us from Portland, Oregon is Jan Leong. She's an economics professor at Willamette University. John Sidalides is in Virginia. He's a principal and geopolitical strategist with Trilogy Advisors. And also with us from Beijing is Victor Gao. He's a chair professor at Suchow University. Victor, why don't I start with you? Uh, what do you make of this move? Well, first of all, the U.S. decision is to be condemned and to be deplored. It's the worst you can imagine. And history will mark this as a day in infamy in China-U.S. relations, and the responsibilities fall squarely on the United States. And this also leaves China with no other option but to do a tit-for-tat retaliation. So eventually, both the Chinese people and the American people are going to suffer the consequences. And I think fundamentally, uh, at the core of the issue, is that there are people in Washington who cannot accept the fact that China is rising, and eventually China will outgrow the size of the United States. But this is the mega trend. In about another 10 years or so, China will be larger than that of the United States, and P 
people, decision makers in Washington need to accept that as a reality and deal with that. China and the United States need to find a way to get along with each other rather than, for example, doing all these lowballs from Washington. John, let me get your thoughts on, uh, on what the spokesman from the Chinese uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs had to say. He reacted to this move. Uh, I want to play for you what he said and then get your reaction on the other side. So let's listen. For some time, the U.S. government has been shifting the blame to China with stigmatizing and unwarranted attacks against China's social system, harassing Chinese diplomatic and consular staff in the U.S., intimidating and interrogating Chinese students, and confiscating their personal electronic devices and even detaining them without a reason. The unilateral closure of China's consulate general in Houston within a short period of time is an unprecedented escalation of its recent actions against China. It's a political provocation, unilaterally launched by the U.S., which seriously violates international law, the basic norms governing international relations, and the bilateral consular treaty between China and the United States. China strongly condemns such an outrageous and unjustified move, which will sabotage China-U.S. relations. We urge the U.S. to immediately withdraw its erroneous decision. Otherwise, China will make a legitimate and necessary response. So, John, you heard what he had to say. He says it's outrageous, unjustified, it's illegal. It does seem rather dramatic and rash, kind of came out of the blue. Uh, what's the motivation behind all of this? Well, it's difficult to ascertain the specific motivation, and even the State Department pronouncements today were somewhat vague. But I do believe, Mike, that we're seeing, first of all, another step in a systematic, comprehensive U.S. counter strategy to what the Trump administration and a growing bipartisan consensus sees as a series of unlawful, illicit, and belligerent uh, Chinese actions in Asia and around the world. And with this particular incident, my sources inform me that it may be tied to U.S. accusations that there are Chinese operatives that are engaged in COVID vaccine research theft at major medical facilities in Houston, uh, specifically at Texas A&M University and at MD Anderson Medical Center. So I think this is going to be, uh, as Victor just said, one more series in tit for tat. Uh, I don't know when China will retaliate. I'm sure that it will. Uh, I'm not sure that it's going to happen tomorrow or next week. It could be until after the November elections. Einar, I want to get your thoughts on what John just said, because uh, he's outlined a lot more than what we're getting from the State Department. I mean, they give you two words, egregious behavior. Um, what do you make of what he said and, and these accusations that are coming from the United States? Well, there's a litany of excuses that say that this is somehow strategic. And while there is a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, antagonism between these two uh, countries, uh, the, the clear indication is that this was sparked by something else. Uh, in essence, the uh, State Department wanted to return um, somewhere between 800 and 1,000 U.S. diplomats and their family to China. And this, this is something I, I got from a fairly reliable source. And unfortunately, they said that they did not want to take the, uh, any tests. They didn't want uh, any COVID-19 tests because they said you'll be harvesting our DNA. And second, they said that a 14-day quarantine would not be covered by diplomatic immunity. So it seems that this was an opportunistic uh, time for the Trump administration to turn the conversation away from COVID-19, follow the O'Donnell playbook, remember the one where it says, keep attacking China, do not defend your actions. So this is where it stands right now. Uh, we are talking about this issue instead of the number of deaths and people infected by COVID-19 and where the U.S. is going economically. And this is uh, to Trump's uh, strong card. He wants to appear strong. That's why he's sending troops into U.S. cities. Uh, and this is just one more attempt to divide America's attention and the world's attention from the fact that things are not going well in the U.S. or for Donald Trump. And you say uh, keep attacking uh, China. Well, the U.S. Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, uh, pretty vocal about this. He's just met with his counterparts in the U.K., as uh, Nathan mentioned. Then he's in Denmark talking to his counterpart there. He said the action in Houston isn't just on behalf of the U.S., it's also for our allies, as he put it. Let's listen. This is not just American intellectual property, but stolen. It's been European intellectual property, too, causing hundreds, costing hundreds of thousands of jobs, good jobs for hardworking people all across Europe and America, stolen by the Chinese Communist Party. President Trump has said enough. 
we're not going to we're, we're not going to allow this to continue to happen. Where they you've seen the remarks that uh, National Security Advisor O'Brien gave, that FBI Director Ray gave, and that Attorney General Barr has given. We, we are setting out clear expectations for how the Chinese Communist Party is going to behave, and when they don't. We're going to take actions that protect the American people, protect our security, our national security, and also protect our economy and jobs. So, Einer, to your point, he's saying he's trying to help the hardworking uh, Americans as well as European workers. Uh, that China's kind of taking their jobs away. Give me your thoughts on that. Well, he identified the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, he's, he's doing campaign surrogate work. Uh, and the irony here, though, is that when he starts mentioning um, European interests, well, where is, what is he doing in Denmark? He's trying to get Denmark to, um, in essence, do away with this Nord Stream project, which would allow Russian gas to flow into Europe. So I don't know that uh, Pompeo's uh, rhetoric fits with the reality. It's simply, you know, as I said, campaign-style tactics. He is a surrogate. He's uh, been instructed by Donald Trump and wants to attack, uh, use China as an opportunity to both change the conversation and to further his goals that says that uh, the U.S. must remain a he hegemon and China must be put down or put in its place. Yan Liang, uh, there are also economic uh, considerations to take into uh, account here. Uh, Alan DuPont is a chief executive at a risk consultancy group, and he was saying this dispute is turning into a winner-take-all kind of contest. It's likely to escalate, and it's not just going to impact the U.S. and China. It's going to impact uh, global supply chains, business, finance, everywhere. So from an economic standpoint, as we continue to see this escalation, uh, talk to us about the fallout from that. Well, I think that's a great question to take an economic perspective on this. Um, I think, you know, the previous speakers that talked about the China's rise, um, it's on the way to take over as the biggest country, a biggest economy in the world. Um, and I think the U.S. is taking a very uneasy approach to this. Um, so I think the most recent move, um, in addition to the political calculations, I think there is also the economic motivations behind. Um, let's not forget that the China's economy just recovered and registered a 3.2 percent of growth rate in the second quarter um, of 2020. Where in the U.S., interestingly, you know, when Pompeo was talking about you know protecting our jobs, as a matter of fact, uh, since the pandemic. Um, the new unemployment claims in the U.S. has accumulated to um, 50 million. So 50 million new unemployment claims. And that's how dire the situation is. So I think, you know, for the United States, really it's a time to look inward, um, how to create jobs. Um, you know, there is a, a rising voice of government guarantee jobs. Um, there are new green, green New Deals, many wonderful um, approaches, um, um, you know, to be taken rather than putting the blame on China on, or on other countries in the world. And by the way, I think, you know, the phase two deal as what President Trump seems to be disinterested, um, China is actually making all the efforts. Um, just last week, China has made two daily largest purchase corn um, from the U.S. And China's uh, June imports has gone up by 3%, uh, reversing the contraction in, back in May. So I think in many aspects, um, China's recovery is going to help not only um, China, but also the global economy. So I don't think the U.S. should take an exit um, from this sort of global economic recovery. But what was China? And, and John, let me get your thoughts on that, because obviously the United States is suffering. Uh, China, as uh, Yan Liang says, doing their part as far as this uh, trade deal is concerned. Let me ask you about uh, the other thing that she was talking about, 50 million people unemployed. Right now, is this a good time to be doing this sort of thing? Well, any responsible U.S. president is going to be able to look after the domestic situation and pressing domestic issues such as the, uh, the recession that's a result of the COVID lockdowns and also the need to grow jobs while addressing national security issues. So any president is able to do both. And I think what you're seeing here really is, especially with Secretary Pompeo's upcoming speech on Friday, again, part of a whole of government approach from the Trump administration that began with Robert O'Brien's speech in June, followed by the FBI director a week later, and then several days ago, Attorney General William Barr, all laying out a series of comprehensive responses by the United States to, again, what a growing bipartisan consensus in Washington sees as sort of malign activities by China 
including to the economic point that much of the American heartland was hollowed out by the deliberate outsourcing by American corporations looking to do business and access China's increasingly affluent market. So all of this now is coming to a head, and I think what you'll see with Pompeo's speech, it's not an accident that will be given at the Nixon Library. I think he's going to declare the U.S. strategy of strategic engagement with China that began with President Nixon and Henry Kissinger in the 1970s, that Pompeo will declare it obsolete and that it's time for a new arrangement with China. I think it's going to be a startling presentation, so I think we all need to be tuning in in 48 hours. Well, I think we will. Uh, you heard Victor uh, John saying that a responsible president can focus on the domestic and the international. But uh, we learned from uh, US, former U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton in his book that a lot of times uh, Trump, uh, what, what you see is not necessarily what's actually going on. And he talked about uh, Trump praising the Saudi crown prince, but he said he was doing it. This was after Jamal Khashoggi was killed to kind of divert attention away from Ivanka Trump, some negative stories about her. So is this an effort of basically making China the boogeyman so people don't focus on the U.S. response to the pandemic, which has been rather slipshod and haphazard? I think everyone can <clears throat> try to interpret Trump's true motivation. However, I think records already show that while President Trump is very anti-China, uh, his family business, uh, companies and hotels, etc., have imported huge amount of Made in China products to decorate their homes, their hotels, their mansions, etc. So you are talking about the highest level of hypocrisy mankind probably has ever seen. And I think if the American peoples really want to be misled by such level of indecency, double standards, and uh, hypocrisy, then the victims will be the American people. But I would believe that the American people eventually will realize what they are talking about in the uh, White House. And this kind of behavior should be fully exposed, and they should not hold China-U.S. relations hostage. And China and mankind should not tolerate such vilification, such slandering, such distortion of truths. The Chinese growth is based on the hard work and the sweat of the Chinese people over the past 42 years or so. And this is the reality. And no one in Washington, no one anywhere in the world can hold the Chinese growth, stop, stop the growth and derail the growth. So decision makers in Washington really need to come to reality and they need to figure out how to do with China, not only today when they are trying to manhandle China, but about 10 years later, how to deal with China much more, much larger and more impactful than it is today and figure out how China and the United States need to get along with each other gradually. And uh -huh. this gives me reason why I'm confident about the medium term and longer term growth of our two bilateral relations. But currently, uh, things not uh, in good standing. Einer, I want to talk to you about uh, President Trump, a recent interview he did with CBS News. He said he's not interested in trade talks with China. Let's listen. We had a great trade deal, but as soon as the deal was done, the ink wasn't even dry, and they hit us with the plague, okay? So right now, I'm not interested in talking to China about another deal. I'm interested in doing other things with China. And how will you hold the Chinese government accountable for COVID-19? You'll see. You'll see. It's not for you. It's for me. But you will hold them accountable. You'll see. He keeps saying, uh, hit us with the plague. You hear this uh, China virus all the time. Uh, is diplomacy virtually finished between the U.S. administration and China at this stage? And where does the trade deal go? Well, uh, quite frankly, it's finished between Donald Trump and the rest of the world. I mean, remember, this is not just about uh, China. Uh, the U.S. has been retreating under Donald Trump from uh, most of its international engagements at the U.N., whether it's uh, the World Health Organization, UNESCO, Human Rights, uh, Paris Climate Accord, the issue with Israel and recognizing Jerusalem. Uh, th this has seen U.S. receding, but at the same time, trying to use uh, China as the scapegoat to say that it's all China's fault. Uh, I don't know exactly how it's China's fault that um, American uh, industries uh, were attracted to a large market, first as a production base, then as a place to sell. Uh, and this is the real uh, victim in this, is that you know, U.S. Business Council has already come out and said, how can we plan 
with these types of things going on. Uh, the trade ex escalation, uh, diplomacy, uh, threatening the families of people that they assume are associated with the Communist Party, attacking students. How is this supposed to bring these countries closer together? At this point, Donald Trump doesn't care. You think it's a coincidence that he has to do a 180 degree turn on wearing masks and the seriousness of COVID-19, and then the next day it becomes about closing the, uh, uh, the Houston consulate. I mean, this is clearly just a way of detracting attention from the real issues so that he can pursue his election uh, strategy, which is to attack China at every turn. John, you were talking about how a president can focus on domestic and international at the same time. You would think uh, a president who's made such a big deal out of uh, trade talks with China, all of a sudden saying he's no longer interested, that's kind of a surprise. What's your take on this? I think the administration really was struck by the May 2019 walkout by the Chinese delegation on the structural reforms, and that's when it began to sink in the White House, that those structural reforms are not going to take place, and it would lead eventually to a, a partial deal like we saw in phase one. But the president right now isn't concerned with what China and the U.S. are doing at a corporate level. I mean, the trade's going to continue at the, to the tune of billions and tens of billions of dollars. But strategically, the idea that what led the U.S. to adopt these policies over the last 20 years of constructive engagement was the idea that China would become a quote-unquote responsible stakeholder in the liberal international rules-based order. And now the sense is that China is seeking to upend it and to create great damage to this order around the world in ways that are deleterious to the Western way of life. So I don't think it's necessarily about China becoming an economic giant. That's China's rightful place. It was the world's largest economy for 2,000 years. But I think there's a fundamental difference in the value system between the United States and the advanced industrial countries and what they see as the rigid ideology of the Chinese Communist Party, separate from the Chinese people, whom Washington and the American people respect greatly. Yan Liang, I want to get your thoughts on what John just said, because you hear a lot of that here in Washington, not just from Republicans, but from Democrats alike. Uh, how do we flip this conversation? I, um, I would say I disagree respectfully um, with what John said. I don't think, you know, President Trump's abandonment, um, at least as of, as of now, because he can be very unpredictable, um, his abandonment of the so-called, you know, uh, face true deal is not because of his disappointment about China's attitude towards a structural reform. But rather, I think he has redone his calculation. Um, he had wanted to play this economic card by engaging China with a trade deal and strike a you know, historical uh, deal uh, that would help to revive the economy and win his political support. I think now, now it's uh, more and more remote that you know, an economic recovery uh, or prosperity is going to return anytime soon um, before his re-election. So I think he has switched his strategy. Um, instead of tr engaging China with an, a trade deal, um, he is now setting up China as this external enemy and play tough on China in order to win his political support. And I think this is very disconcerting because this is not just a trade deal, um, but it's an open, transparent, and predictable official channels for China and, and the U.S. to hear each other and to be heard, um, including uh, issues like national security or intellectual property rights protection. Um, the fact that I think you know um, the U.S. unilaterally at this point um, turned the back against the second uh, sort of phase to trade deal or the continued negotiations with China is very disconcerting. And it's definitely uh, um, at odd with you know, Trump's claim about you know, engaging China and how to uh, work on international securities and domestic issues um, concurrently. Victor Gao, uh, you've sat in on these sorts of meetings between high level uh, US and Chinese delegations. You know the importance of dialogue. And these kinds of steps actually eliminate dialogue or cut back on it considerably. Talk to me about that and, and the impact of something like this. When you're not talking, uh, things can kind of go off the road in a hurry. And also, what's likely to be China's response to this? Because as we've talked about before, there's this kind of tit-for-tat nature whenever things go this way. What do you expect China to do in response to what the United States has done? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, for two largest economies in the world, the United States and China, diplomacy will be the most important thing. And there will always be differences between these two countries. 
and uh, there should be no expectation that China should become another United States. Uh, our previous panelists talked about the values. China will always have its own values, and it will be different, significantly different from that of the United States. And no one in the West should really expect that China will have the same value than Western countries, for example. What will be the fun for the world when we only have one set of values? The world is a diverse place, and China stands on its own tradition, on its own value, on its own beliefs, for example. And this is exactly what's troubling for everyone in the world. Whereas China is doing everything we can to save every life, even those in their 90s, there seems to be a complete cold-hearted disregard for lives. You are not talking about Chinese lives, American lives. More than 140,000 good American lives have perished without the government really putting in a lot of effort to save them. And we are talking about one million people being infected in a month, uh, in two weeks. This is really terrible. This is really a demonstration of lack of caring for the true human right lives of the American people at the very core. Now, for China, we need to do our homework. We need to stand firm on our own principles. We do not want to be an right. enemy of the United States. The Chinese people are no enemy of the American people. Right. Well, and Victor, going forward, I think we need to figure out a way how to deal with each other. Yes, that's a the good point. point. But let me let me ask Einer one final question before we go, because I want to ask you, Einer, about this speech that Pompeo is going to give. You know, Wang Yi, the foreign minister of China, said uh, that the relations have the worst they've been since 1979. But he called for peaceful coexistence. I, I don't suspect you think uh, Pompeo will make the same statement when he's in Yorba Linda, California, at the Nixon Library, do you? No, I don't. I agree with John. This is going to be some over-the-top statement uh, that looks to undermine China and the international order, as uh, Donald Trump has been doing all along. And do you suspect that this is just going to continue as a march right up until Election Day? Absolutely. I mean, you're going to see on a daily basis, as we have seen for the last month, uh, attacks on China, provocations. Donald Trump wants to create an incident with China, not a war, but some sort of military incident or, or very serious diplomatic one in which he can then claim that anybody who doesn't support his position is unpatriotic. This has been a, a, a very, very uh, deep narrative that he's been spreading on his domestic side, and it unites this idea that China is yeah. the enemy and that everyone has to rally around yeah. him while he fights them. Einer, thanks so much for your observations. I want to thank all our panelists. Uh, that is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Mike Walter, Washington, D.C.